So welcome back to the channel. Today we'll be doing a review of this best-selling book by Stephen R. Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you want to know the secret sauce behind the success of millionaires, leaders, and world changers, this right here is the book for you. I'll be highlighting some of my key takeaways in this episode, and I'm convinced that by the end of it, you'll be glad that you clicked on this video. In fact, I'm sure that your future self is already thanking you for making that particular decision. Now, what I love about this book is that it has completely changed the way I look at life, the way I look at personal development, the way I look at success, and what it actually takes to be a success in life. It's a book that I'd highly recommend to anyone, whether you're feeling stuck in life or maybe your career is great, but your social life is in shambles, whether you're married and you guys do not necessarily fight, but there is no excitement anymore and it's like the relationship has gone still whether you're a parent raising up a teenage kid and you seem to be losing them every single day as in it's a wholesome book that encompasses nearly all aspects of life from the personal to the family to the corporate and society in general now these seven habits that we're going to go through in just a second will help you in your journey towards becoming an effective leader an effective colleague an effective spouse and an effective parent but before we get into them let's talk about paradigms and principles this will make it easier for us to take in the seven habits paradigm means model perception or frame of reference it's the way we see the world how we perceive understand and interpret it a simple way to understand a paradigm is to look at it as a map a map of kenya is not the territory of kenya it's just a map it's a representation of various aspects of the territory of kenya and that is precisely what a paradigm is a theory an explanation or model of something else so let's say you're a kenyan you've traveled to tanzania for a vacation you don't have your google maps the only thing that you have is one of those old maps that you used to have before smartphones came around now you want to get to a certain location in the city of Dodoma. Now the map that you have is the map of Dar es Salaam but due to a printing error it is labeled Dodoma. You can imagine the frustration. So you might work on your behavior. You could try harder, be more diligent, double your speed but your efforts will only succeed in getting you to the wrong place faster. You might work on your attitude. You could think more positively. You still wouldn't get to the right place but perhaps you wouldn't even care. Your attitude would be so positive you'd be happy wherever you are. Point is you'd still be lost. The fundamental problem has nothing to do with your behavior or attitude, but with the fact that you have the wrong map. If you have the right map, diligence becomes valuable. And when you encounter frustrating obstacles along the way, then attitude will make a real difference. But the first and most important requirement is the accuracy of the map. Now your map is your paradigm in reference to the seven habits. Keep that in mind. Each of us has many, many maps in our heads, which can be divided into two main categories. Maps of the way things are, in other words, realities, and maps of the way things should be. In other words, values. We interpret everything we experience through these mental maps and we rarely question their accuracy. We are usually not even aware that we have them. We simply assume that the way we see things is the way they really are or the way they should be. Now, our attitudes and behaviors grow out of these assumptions and the way we see things is the source of the way we think and the way we act. So to illustrate what I'm talking about, there are two pictures in this book that I want us to look at. There's this picture right here, picture number one. Take a few seconds to just study it carefully. Then there's this other one, picture number two look at it keenly as well now tell me what you see in picture number two you can pause the video for like 10 seconds and type your answers in the comments below did you see a woman in the second picture how would you say she is about 20 maybe 25 years old looks lovely with a petite nose very mindful very demure if you're a guy you'd probably want to take her out right what if i told you that you're wrong that the second picture is one of a woman in her 60s probably 70s she looks sad and has a big nose I know, you think I'm crazy. Now let's look at the second picture again, this time more keenly. Do you see the old woman? Can you see her big nose? <laughs> if you haven't yet, let me show you a third picture, picture number three. Look at it carefully. You can pause the video again and study this picture closely. Now let's go back to the second picture. Can you see the old woman now? You can again pause the video for a few seconds so that you can see everything in detail. So if you haven't seen the old woman, let me help you out. Here's her face. This is her hair covering up part of her forehead. She has something over her head. And this here is her shawl or scarf. Here is her big nose. Here is her left eye. Here is her chin. And this line here is her mouth or lips. Now I'm sure you can see that she's not as young as you initially thought, right? See how conditioning can easily affect our perceptions and our paradigms. By showing you the first picture, that is the picture number one, I influenced you such that when you looked at 
the second picture all you could see is a young beautiful woman but when i showed you the third picture and after explaining it to you you are now able to see that the woman in that second picture wasn't as young as you had previously thought if showing you that picture for only about 10 seconds has had that much influence on the way you see things now imagine conditioning that lasts a lifetime from when you're born till the age you are right now more than 20 years of conditioning our families neighborhoods we grew up in schools we attended our churches our work environment countries we were born in all these have silently and unconsciously impacted us in a way and they have helped shape our frame of reference our paradigms and our maps and these resultant paradigms are the source of our attitudes and behaviors so trying to change the outward attitudes and behaviors may not yield any results if we fail to critically examine the basic paradigms from which those attitudes and behaviors flow that short exercise of the old and young woman demonstrates how powerfully our paradigms affect the way we interact with others we tend to think that we see things as they are that we are objective but this is not entirely true we see the world not as it is we see it as we are or in other words as we are conditioned to see it so when we open our mouths to describe what we see we are essentially describing ourselves our perceptions and paradigms and when other people disagree with us we think that there's something wrong with them but like we've just seen two people can both see the same thing they can disagree and yet both of them can be right the author of this book says that it's not logical it's psychological so the more aware you are of where your attitudes and behaviors come from the more aware you are that what you see may not be the reality and that it could be as a result of your conditioning with this kind of awareness you become more open to examining your paradigms you become more receptive to different perceptions and paradigms by other people and by looking at the bigger picture you're likely to have a more objective view so stephen references a book called the structure of scientific revolution by by Thomas Kuhn, which highlights that no significant scientific breakthrough came as a result of sticking with the old way of thinking. All worthwhile inventions were born out of a paradigm shift, breaking away from the conventional and old ways of thinking, the old paradigm. There is this quote by Oren Harari that I really love and I feel as though it is appropriate in this case. The quote says, the electric light did not come out of the continuous improvement of candles. It took a paradigm shift to even try to invent something as revolutionary as that. Same way it took a paradigm shift for the Wright brothers to envision that humans could actually fly like birds high up in the sky. So paradigm shifts move us from one way of seeing the world to a totally different one. And with this shift, powerful changes happen. It is worth noting that a paradigm shift may be in either positive or negative direction. And whether we bear the correct or incorrect paradigms, these paradigms are the source of our attitudes and behaviors. And our attitudes and behaviors will ultimately affect our relationships with others. So it all starts with a paradigm. That's the source. Get that wrong and everything else gets affected. For every thousand hacking at the leaves of evil, there is one striking at the root. So the leaves are your attitudes and behaviors. The roots are your paradigms out of which your attitudes and behaviors flow. So to make any significant improvements, stop hacking at the leaves and focus on the roots. Now let's quickly talk about principles. Principles are natural laws that cannot be broken. These are laws that are as unchanging, as real and indisputable as the law of gravity. Remember we say that paradigms are like maps and whilst they try to explain the territory, they are not the territory themselves. And we also saw that the maps or paradigms emerge out of our experiences and conditioning which makes them a subjective reality so the objective reality on the other hand is the territory and this objective reality is composed of the principles that govern human growth effectiveness and happiness these principles or natural laws are self-evident and part of the human consciousness they seem to appear in all humans irrespective of their social conditioning for instance the principle of fairness out of which the concept of equality and justice are born we all seem to have an innate sense of the idea of fairness even little children different people depending on their conditioning may have different ideas of how fairness is defined and achieved but there is almost a universal awareness of the idea same thing with principles such as integrity and honesty human dignity service excellence and quality it's worth noting though that principles are different from practices so practice is a specific activity or action and a practice that works in a certain scenario may not be appropriate in another for instance for a parent as you're raising your second child you quickly realize that you cannot raise them exactly like you did the first child. While practices are dependent on the situation, principles have this universal application and they apply to individuals, marriages, families, and organizations. Principles are also not to be confused with values. A gang of thieves share the same values, but they are in violation of principles such as fairness, integrity, and honesty. Principles are the territory, values are the maps. And when we value correct principles, we have truth, we have knowledge of things as they are. So principles are the unchanging and self-evident guidelines for humans. 
human conduct. And the more closely our maps or paradigms are aligned to these principles or natural laws, the more effective we can be as people. Now that paradigms and principles are clear, we can move on to the seven habits. Starting off with habit number one, be proactive now being proactive means more than just taking initiative as humans we are responsible for our own lives our behaviors are a function of our decisions not our conditions we have the initiative and responsibility to make things happen i repeat we have the initiative and most importantly the responsibility to make things happen i'm stressing this because i want us to look carefully at the word responsibility which is a combination of two words response and ability so responsibility means that you have the ability to choose your response and highly proactive people recognize Recognize this responsibility. They do not blame circumstances, conditions, or conditioning for their behavior. They know that their behavior is a product of their own conscious choices based on values. Their behavior is not a product of their conditions based on feelings. This then means that we have all the power. The power is within us, but most of us choose to delegate this power to their circumstances, to their bringing, and to their conditions. And they act as victims of these conditions, helpless victims who, instead of acting upon life, they let life act upon them. But the author reminds us that it's not what happens to us, but our responses to what happens to us that hurts us. And like we've said, taking responsibility means that we have the ability to choose how we respond. It empowers us. What matters is how we respond to what we experience in life. Proactive people are people who are solutions to the problems, not problems themselves. They do what is necessary to get the job done. So by picking up this book, that in itself is being proactive. By choosing to click on this particular video and watching it, that is being proactive as well. It takes initiative to learn the seven habits. The responsibility is on you to act, not waiting to be acted upon. We say that our behaviors and attitudes flow out of our paradigms. And by using our self-awareness, we can examine our paradigms to see if we are proactive or not. And one way to do that is by looking at our language. The language of reactive people absolves them of any responsibility. They'll say things like, ah, that's me, that's the way I am. What this person is really saying is that there's nothing they can do about it. It's like they are powerless. They're simply waiting on life to act upon them. There's no initiative there. That's the language of reactive people. They'll say things like, I can't do that. I can't read a book. I can't go to the gym. I don't have the time. What they're actually saying is that something outside of them, in this particular case time, is controlling them. They're simply saying that they are not free to choose their actions. They are not taking the responsibility for their actions. So let's look at a few more examples of reactive and proactive language. A reactive person will say, there's nothing I can do. A proactive person will say, let's look at our alternatives. See? taking responsibility. A reactive person might also say, that's just the way I am. But a proactive person will say, I can choose a different approach. A reactive person will say, I have to do that. It's like they have no choice. They are not free to choose their actions. So they are saying that circumstances or other people are forcing them to do what they do. But a proactive person will have a different perspective. They will say, I will choose. The keyword here is choose an appropriate response. Now, the major problem about reactive language is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's something called the Pygmalion effect. This is where high expectations lead to higher performance. Conversely, low expectations lead to poor performance. So if you have low expectations of your partner, for example, they will most likely not surprise you. But if you expect more from them, then they might as well live up to your higher expectations. Same thing happens with yourself. If you take no responsibility and blame your situation on the society, on your parents, or on your conditioning, then you will find evidence to validate this. And by so doing, you end up cementing your initial beliefs. There's a study that was done in 1968 where elementary school students were given an IQ test. Results were not shown to the teachers, but they were told that 20% of the students were expected to do better than the rest following the results of the IQ test. Please note, this group of students, the 20%, were chosen at random, meaning there was nothing particularly special about them or their IQ. Later on in the year, it was observed that these students performed better than the rest. The study concluded that the high expectations by the teachers on this particular group of students influenced their achievement, meaning performance can be positively or negatively influenced by the expectations of others. So as a parent, if you have low expectations of your child to do well in school, this might just influence them negatively and they may end up underperforming. Same case when it comes to relationships. If the people around you have low expectations of you, this might limit you as a person. So surround yourself with people who expect more of you. This makes you believe more in your own abilities and you end up performing better. Similarly, if you have low expectations of yourself, if you believe you have no power over your life, that you're a helpless victim, your actions will work towards fulfilling this self-imposed prophecy. So it's time to take responsibility. Take charge, my friend. Be proactive. Don't be like reactive people who instead of rewriting their scripts, all they do is acting out the scripts written by their parents, their colleagues, and the society. And if you ever find yourself thinking that the problem is out there, stop yourself. Because that right there 
is the problem. So before moving on to the next habit, it's worth mentioning that most of the problems we face are within our direct or indirect control, but there are some that we have no control over. These are problems that basically we cannot do anything about, such as our past. But while we cannot control them, we can still take the responsibility to genuinely and peacefully accept these problems and learn to live with them. As in you're still taking the initiative to respond this way so that you do not empower the problems and let them control you. There's a well-known prayer by Alcoholics Anonymous that best summarizes this point. It says, Lord, give me the courage to change the things which can and ought to be changed, and the serenity to accept the things which cannot be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. So moving on to habit number two, which is begin with the end in mind. Now, beginning with the end in mind means starting with a clear understanding of your destination. It is based on the principle that all things are created twice. There is the first creation, which is mental. Then there's a second creation which is physical. Before you build a house, you must first have a plan, a blueprint, a design of how you want it to look like. Before you go on a trip or a vacation, you must have your itinerary in place. Everything in life obeys this principle that all things are created twice. However, not all first creations are by design, some are by default. If you're not proactive, remember habit number one, if you're not proactive to consciously design your first creation, then you will by default be living according to the scripts handed down to you by circumstances, conditioning, and the society. You will not be in control of your own destiny. Your life will basically be a function of other people's influence. Imagine building a house using a design and blueprint that someone else drew up for you. Yes, you will build the house, but you will build a house in a way that someone else wants it. Maybe you wanted a house with four bedrooms, but the design you have is one of two bedrooms. See what we mean when we say that you need to proactively design your first creation. But most people tend to abdicate this responsibility by placing their own first creation in the hands of circumstances and other people. We live life with the scripts that were handed down to us by our parents, our colleagues, and the society in general. And the funny thing, or let me say the sad thing, is that most of these scripts are incomplete or incorrect. They are wrong. They need rescripting or changing. And the process of changing this script is essentially what we are calling a paradigm shift. And remember we say that a paradigm is like a pair of glasses. It basically affects the way you see everything in your life. But to change these scripts, or for this paradigm shift to occur, you need both self-awareness and imagination. Self-awareness is the realization that you can stand apart from yourself and assess the current scripts that you hold. Imagination will then enable you to envision a new reality that is not yet there. If we use a computer metaphor, habit one says you are the programmer. Habit two then says write the program. Now until you accept the idea that you are responsible, that you are the programmer, then you will never invest in writing the program. So as you're writing the program, as you're rewriting your script, it needs to be in harmony with your values and your personal mission statement. Now a personal mission statement is like your personal constitution. It's a solid and concise expression of your innermost values and principles. It's the criterion by which you measure everything else in your life. It's what you refer to even in the midst of social ambiguity and change. A mission statement gives you vision and values which direct your life. It gives you the basic direction from which you can set your short-term and long-term goals. If you don't know how to go about making one, please make sure to subscribe to the channel because I'll be posting a video this coming week on how exactly you can do that. I'll also share mission statements by other high performers for you to reference. Now, there's a study that was done by Dr. Charles Garfield where he sought to find out the common trait of most high performers in in both business and sports. What he found out was that almost all successful businessmen and athletes practice habit number two. Almost all peak performers visualize, they see it, they feel it, they experience it before they can actually do it. They begin with the end in mind. That's how crucial this habit is. Now let's look at it from the organizational context. The author shares a very interesting definition of management and leadership in this book. He says that management is doing things right, while leadership is doing things the right way. So think of it this way. If we were climbing a ladder, management is efficiency in climbing the ladder, while leadership determines whether the ladder is leaning against the right wall. So as a leader, you need to begin with the end in mind. This means starting with a clear understanding of your destination. You need to know exactly where you are going so that you better understand where you are right now. This helps you ensure that the steps you take are in the right direction. We all know it's quite possible to be very busy without necessarily being effective. Effectiveness does not depend solely on the amount of effort we spend, but on whether that effort is spent in the right place. And that's why most of us find ourselves trapped in the activity trap. You're caught up in the busyness of life, working harder and harder to climb the ladder of success, only to find out that it's leaning against the wrong wall. And if the ladder is not leaning against the right wall, every step that we take will just take us to the wrong destination faster. It doesn't matter how 
busy you are, how efficient you are, the only way to be effective is by starting with the end in mind. And that's why a lot of people find themselves having achieved success that feels empty. They spent their entire lives chasing success at the expense of what really mattered most to them in life. The author of the book gives the example of getting at the top of the corporate ladder at the expense of having a family, which is really what you valued most and now the chance to do that is gone. So what he proposes as the remedy here is writing a eulogy, your own eulogy. Think about what you want your family, your friends, your colleagues, and the community to say about you at your funeral. What kind of daughter, mother, father, sibling, friend, business associate would they describe you as? What accomplishments and contributions will they credit you with? How will you be remembered? This way, you'll be able to know what really matters most to you. Is it your family? Is it your career? Or is it both? So writing your own eulogy helps you begin with that picture of you at the end of your life as your frame of reference or criterion against which everything else is examined. And by keeping the end clearly in mind, then everything else you do on a daily basis becomes aligned to that final destination. And anything that detracts you from that destination, you set it aside. So each day of your life then ends up contributing in a meaningful way to the vision that you have of your life as a whole. Meaning, you won't find yourself having achieved success that feels empty. I have to say that I found the idea of a eulogy to be quite interesting. I know that for some of you it might sound a bit extreme but it's quite effective because it forces you to use your imagination and actually see yourself at the end of your road. So what legacy would you like to leave behind? Anyway as we move on to the next habit I'd love to know what you think about this eulogy idea. Would you try it or have you ever tried it? Be sure to stick around because I'll be doing an episode on how to write your own eulogy in the coming week. So on to habit number three of the seven habits of highly effective people put fast things fast. So going back to the computer metaphor, we say that habit one says you're the programmer. Habit two tells you to write the program. Now habit three says it's time to run the program. It's time to leave the program. Effective management is putting fast things fast. While leadership decides what fast things are, it is management that puts them fast day by day. So there are basically two factors that define an activity. An activity is either urgent, which means it requires immediate attention, or it is important, which means it is something that contributes heavily to your mission, your values and your high priority goals. So there's a time management matrix here that we can use to illustrate this. It has four quadrants. On one axis we have the important and on the other axis we have the urgent. Our quadrant one activities are the urgent and important. This is where you are always in crisis management, you're always putting out fires, you have meetings to attend, reports to share, emails to respond to, calls to return. As in there is constant interruptions. Quadrant three activities are urgent but not important. The urgency of these matters is often based on the priority and expectations of others. For example, Jen from HR wants you to urgently send her a certain report because she has a presentation in the afternoon. As we often say in my department, your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency on my part. Quadrant 4 are neither urgent nor important. These are trivial tasks that serve to waste your time. Yet most people spend a lot of time here in this quadrant. Quadrant 2 are the important but not urgent. These are the things that we know we need to do but we seldom get around to doing them because they are not urgent. These are the things that if done on a regular basis, they will make a significant positive difference in our lives. Quadrant two is the heart of effective personal management. This is a sweet spot right here. It's why you need to be spending most of your productive time doing things like planning, thinking ahead, doing the preventive tasks that keep the situations from escalating into crisis to begin with. This way, you ensure that tasks don't get ignored long enough to become urgent and start acting on you. So in quadrant two, you're in Full control of your time and tasks. You act on them instead of them acting on you. You're able to put fast things fast. Now, putting fast things fast also means saying no. Once you have decided what your high priority tasks are, you need to have the courage to pleasantly and non-apologetically say no to other things. And the only way to say no is when you have other pressing and more important goals that you can say yes to. Essentially, every time you say yes to one thing, you're saying no to another. The reverse is also true. So having clear priorities saves you a lot of trouble when it comes to making that decision. The other seems to discourage daily planning. He says that the very language of daily planning focuses on the urgent, the now, which essentially takes us back to either quadrant one or quadrant three, which is exactly where we don't want to be. So instead of daily planning, he's suggesting a weekly planner. And there's a nice template that he shares, which you can look at. Link to that is in the description below. So the key is not to prioritize what is on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. There is a difference. One is where you just list what you think needs to be done and then you rate these listed items based on urgency or importance. Stephen advises that we do it the other way 
way around, which is identifying your priorities and then scheduling them. And this can best be done in the context of the week. So please remember to tie your weekly goals to your personal mission statement. This will ensure that these goals are grounded on a solid framework of correct principles and values. Therefore, increasing your overall effectiveness. So this also helps you to avoid prioritizing and accomplishing things that you need not to be doing at all. There's a quote from another book that I love called Eat That Fog by Brian Tracy. It says, one of the worst uses of time is to do something very well that need not be done at all. I think this is a good time to actually plug in my last episode where I did a review of that best-selling book by Brian Tracy. In that episode, I summarize his 21 tips meant to help you avoid procrastination. So make sure to check it out, especially if you're struggling with getting the most important things done. Link to the video should be somewhere here, but you can also find it in the description below. So now on to habit number four of the seven habits of highly effective people. But before we look at habit number four, we need to quickly look at something the author calls the maturity continuum. Now as human beings, our development from birth to adulthood goes through three stages. That is dependence, independence, and interdependence. Dependence is where we are fully reliant on someone else, like a baby is to a parent. As the baby grows, as they become a teen and eventually a young adult, they slowly become independent and now they can do things for themselves. As they continue to grow and mature, they realize that human life is interdependent. You have to form relationships and cooperate with others. So on the maturity continuum, you move from the paradigm of you, where you take care of me, you are responsible for me, I blame you for the results, to a paradigm of I, where I am now responsible, I can choose, I can make decisions on my own, and finally, to a paradigm of we, where we can cooperate, we can work together and create something great. So to become interdependent, you first need to be independent. And the habits that we've looked at so far are focused on moving you from the dependent to independent. These habits are what the author calls private victories, and they will always precede public victories. These are the seeds that we need to sow before we can eventually harvest. So learning these habits helps you become more self-confident. You get to know yourself in a deeper and more meaningful manner. You get to define yourself from within rather than by people's opinions of you or by comparing yourself with them. So once you're truly independent, Independent, then you have the solid foundation necessary for interdependence and this is where habits 4, 5 and 6 come in. These are what the author calls public victories. Here you will discover the need and desire to build important relationships that have been broken. And with that, I think now we're ready to look at habit number 4 which is think win-win. So regardless of your position in a company, whether you are a C-suite executive or just a casual worker, the moment you step from independence to interdependence in any capacity, you step into a leadership role. You are now in a position of influencing other people. So the author says that the habit of effective interpersonal leadership is think win-win. Now there are six paradigms of human interaction. These are win-win, we have win-lose, there's lose-win, there's lose-lose, win, and finally, win-win or no deal. So let's start with win-win. This is where we seek mutual benefit in our interaction with other people. In a win-win outcome, everyone walks away feeling good about the decision reached. Cooperation is emphasized over competition. The idea behind it is that there's plenty for everyone. One person's success does not have to come at the expense of the next person's. It's not your way or my way. It's a better way, a higher way. So the author says that win-win is a belief in what he calls the third alternative more about that later. So the next one is win-lose. This is where if I win, you lose. It's a zero-sum kind of approach where the success of one person comes at the exclusion of others. The other compares it to the authoritarian style of leadership where I get my way and you don't get yours. People who adopt this approach tend to use either their position, their power, their credentials, privileges, and personality to get what they want. Now, most people have this mentality in their approach towards life and it's something that we are conditioned into from birth. When growing up, our parents used to constantly compare us to our siblings or even friends who are perceived to be doing better than us. In school, our teachers did the same thing. They compared us to the smartest kid in class. In sports, it's the same script. So we grow up thinking that to get any kind of affirmation from our parents, teachers, friends, and the society in general, we have to be better than others. If my parents don't love me as much as they love my sister, then I must be less valuable. So as an adult, you're conditioned to think that for you to get any kind of recognition, you have to win, even if it means others lose. You believe that for your candle to shine brighter, other people's must be put out. Okay, sure, there are scenarios where this kind of approach is unavoidable, but in most cases, it is not the ideal approach. Life is not one big competition that we have to win every time. You'll never hear someone ask between you and your wife who's winning in your marriage because there's no winner or loser in marriage or parenting. 
if both of you aren't winning then you're both losing most of life is all about interdependence as opposed to dependence much of what you need to accomplish will depend on your cooperation with others and competition is counterproductive in this case now let's move on to lose win now these are the nice guys the people pleasers you would rather lose than risk offending others these people gain strength from acceptance by others and popularity you'd rather be in the win lose category than in the lose win category people in the lose win do not have standards and they lack the courage to firmly stand by what they believe in the danger with such people is that since they rarely express their feelings they tend to bury them and the thing with buried feelings is that they never die so they pile up and eventually manifest themselves in the form of psychosomatic illnesses this is as a result of the resentment that builds up over time now the win-lose people whom we talked about just a while ago tend to love the lose win guys because they can easily take advantage of them the other paradigm is the lose lose this is where two stubborn egocentric and strong-willed people meet none is ready to cede ground or compromise it's where you are prepared not to win as long as the other person loses so such people are so concerned about others that they are prepared to burn everything down than risk the chance of someone else winning so these people are vindictive and vengeful they like getting their revenge and getting even they are also obsessed with their desire for others to lose even if it means that they also lose this is the classic eye for an eye which leaves everyone blind it's the philosophy of war if nobody wins then maybe being a loser isn't so bad so the next paradigm is win this is someone who is simply just concerned about their well-being what others are up to is irrelevant to them they do not care whether you win or lose they just care about getting what they want this kind of approach is ideal in scenarios where there is no competition so just secure your bag and let everyone else secure theirs so before you look at the last paradigm of human interaction i have a question for you which one of these five paradigms that we have so far looked at is ideal which one do you think is ideal well the other says that it depends it depends on the context and situation you're faced with for instance in a game of football there will always be winners and losers but in a company you obviously want colleagues collaborating and not competing in an unhealthy manner so a win-win would be ideal here in a close relationship with family and friends sometimes we take a lose-win approach this is especially so if winning comes at the expense of the friendship or relationship so you could compromise for the sake of your loved one there are also instances where winning does not affect anyone else so the win approach would be ideal so the approach largely depends depends on the reality you're faced with at each moment. But in most cases, and due to the interdependent nature of our relationships, whether in business or in personal life, the ideal approach will be the win-win. For instance, in a business negotiation, if we end up with a win-lose outcome and let's say I'm your supplier and you're my customer, yes, I may have won now, but you will leave the room with feelings of resentment towards me and it is unlikely that you will consider me for future business. So a win-lose ends up being a lose-lose in the long run. The other says that if I focus on my own win and don't even consider your point of view, then there's no basis for any kind of productive relationship. Therefore, in any interdependent scenario, the only logical paradigm is the win-win approach. This is because in the long run, if it isn't a win for both of us, then we most certainly will end up losing. Having said that, let's now look at the last paradigm, which is the win-win or no deal. This is what the author calls the higher expression of the win-win approach. It simply means that if we do not find a solution that benefits both of us, then we agree to disagree agreeably. If it's obvious and evident that our values and goals are significantly different or diametrically opposed, then there's no need to waste time getting into an agreement and it's always better when you realize this early before commitments are made so no deal gives the parties freedom to negotiate openly with no hidden agendas you know that if you don't reach a mutually beneficial position then you can always walk away peacefully so it's far better to have no deal than to have one where you feel short change the other says that this kind of approach provides tremendous emotional freedom he gives the example of a family where there's no consensus on which movie to watch so instead of just settling on one and have others enjoy it at the expense of others he says that it's better to just choose no deal and decide to do something else the other however points out that there are scenarios where this approach may not be suitable for instance you wouldn't abandon your child in the name of no deal in this case a compromise would be ideal again context is key but the win-win or no deal paradigm is ideal for most cases and it provides great freedom here's a simple exercise for you what kind of approach do you mostly adopt in your life is it the win-win win-lose lose-win lose-lose win the win-win or no deal and why do you think this is your dominant approach before we move on to habit number five i'd like to quickly talk about the five dimensions of the win-win paradigm which are character relationships agreements systems and processes in the interest of time i'll just talk about character which the other breaks down further into integrity maturity and abundance mentally now if you can't keep commitments to yourself you are likely not to keep commitments that you make to others and this therefore means that people cannot trust you to 
do what you say you will do you lack integrity now the other defines maturity as the balance between courage and consideration he says that to go for a win-win you not only have to be nice but courageous as well you have to be empathetic and confident at the same time you have to be considerate and sensitive and brave at the same time striking a delicate balance between courage and consideration is key in a win-win approach so if you're high on courage and low on consideration then you will be dominant and stubborn but you're not likely to be considerate of others if you're high on consideration and low on courage then you will most likely go for a lose win outcome you will be overly considerate of others but lack the courage to express your position on an issue therefore for a win-win you need to be high on both courage and consideration that way you're able to be empathetic and listen to others points of view while also courageously expressing yourself lastly there is the abundance mentality this is the view that there is plenty of cake for everyone most people are wired to believe that there is never enough resources and opportunities to go around they adopt the scarcity mentality where if one person wins then it means i'm losing so they are always insecure about their position and this makes it difficult to get a win-win when dealing with them such people have a difficult time sharing recognition credit power and even profit when someone else gains they view it as a loss for themselves someone with an abundance mentality however is quite secure in themselves they have no problem sharing recognition profit power and even decision making they understand that the cake is big enough for all of us and therefore reaching a win-win becomes quite easy for them and that's it for habit number four now let's look at habit number five which is seek first to understand then to be understood so there's a story in the book that can really help us put this habit into perspective let's say you have a problem with your eyes and you visit an optometrist after just a few minutes of listening to your problem he takes off his glasses and says to you put these on i've been using them for quite a few years and they've served me quite well i also have another pair at home so you can take mine so you take the pair of glasses place them on your face but your eyesight seems to get even worse you tell this to the optometrist but he replies try harder try harder they are a good pair of glasses they work great me so you try harder but still nothing you can't see a thing then he responds what's wrong with you think positively so you do as he says but your vision isn't improving so you say to him i positively can't see a thing so he then replies you're one ungrateful patient after all i've done for you now let's be honest what are the chances of you ever going back to this optometrist or even referring someone to him zero so we tend not to have much confidence in someone who gives a prescription without a proper diagnosis yet this is exactly what we do when it comes to communication we have this tendency to rush to fix things up with good advice but we often fail to take the time to fully diagnose to really deeply understand the problem first that's why the key to effective interpersonal communication is to seek first to understand then to be understood you'll notice that there are two parts to this habit the first is seek first to understand then to be understood and that is the correct order to ensure effective communication but we mostly do it the other way around and that's where the problem starts most people do not listen with the intent to understand they listen with the intent to reply they are either speaking or preparing to speak they are filtering everything through their own paradigms reading their autobiography into other people's lives they are constantly projecting their own home movies onto other people's behaviors simply put they prescribe their own glasses for everyone with whom they interact they'll say things like oh i know exactly what you're feeling i went through the very same thing let me tell you about my experience so here's the thing we are so deeply scripted in these responses that we don't even realize when we use them now communication entails reading writing speaking and listening we've all spent a lot of time learning how to read and write we sure have spent enough time learning how to speak but no one taught us how to listen which in itself is a critical part of communication we have two ears and one mouth so that we can listen twice as much as we speak now the author of this book says that when another person speaks we are usually listening at one of four levels one we may be ignoring the other person this is where you're not really listening at all two we may practice pretending this is where you're saying words like mm -hmm, yeah right okay three is what the other calls selective listening this is where you're hearing only certain parts of the conversation a good example of this is when your four-year-old is constantly blubbering on your way home after you've picked them up from school so four is attentive listening this is where you're paying close attention and focusing energy on the words that are actually being said now those are the four levels of listening that most of us practice you can let me know in the comments below which one best describes you anyway as you do that let me introduce you to a fifth level of listening which stephen covey calls empathy empathetic listening now empathetic listening is where you listen and not just listening attentively but listening with the intent and the keyword here is intent 
listening with the intent to understand it means seeking first to understand to really understand it's about getting inside another person's frame of reference you look through it and see the world the same way that they see the world you understand their paradigm you understand how they feel empathetic listening is not about agreeing with someone it's about you fully deeply understanding that person emotionally and intellectually as well and this is not an easy thing to do by the way because it requires such a heavy initial investment of time and effort it also requires some level of vulnerability from both parties which explains why it's so much easier in the short run to just hand someone the same pair of glasses that have fit you so well over the years but what you need to remember is that the key to good judgment is understanding by judging fast which is what most of us do a person will never fully understand yet you want to be on the same side of the table looking at the problem together instead of being on opposite sides looking across at each other and often what happens is that when people feel understood they tend to open up and in the process they end up unraveling their own problems and the solutions become clear to them you might not even need to give them any advice so before we head over to habit number six let's talk about the third alternative remember we mentioned it as we were talking about the win-win paradigm and the habit four so after we've understood the other person then we can move on to the other part of the equation i get to do this only after i can explain your point of view as well as you can then and only then can i focus on communicating my own point of view to you so that you can understand it as well so firstly you both get a deep understanding of each other's points of view then we can commit to genuinely seek for a solution that we both feel good about a win-win if you mean so you work together to produce a third alternative solution to our differences one that we can both agree is better compared to what each of us had initially proposed so once you understand that life is not always black and white that it's not always either or and that there are mutually beneficial third alternatives there are win-win solutions then you become more secure in your position you understand that you can step out of your own frame of reference you can get to deeply understand someone else and see the world from their perspective next time you're communicating with other people put aside your autobiography set aside your paradigm and genuinely seek to understand them because when you seek to understand our differences are no longer stumbling blocks to communication and progress instead they become stepping stones to synergy so which brings us to habit number six of the seven habits of highly effective people synergize so have you ever been part of a team where everyone was working together for example to save someone's life do you remember the level of teamwork the trust the cooperation that was experienced in that scenario people setting aside their egos setting aside their interests and everyone working towards a common on goal now that is what we call synergy it's real team speed now synergy simply means that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts it means that the relationship which the parts have to each other is a part in and of itself so one plus one is not two but one plus one equals three or more that's synergy so the essence of synergy is to value differences and respect them to build on strengths and compensate for weaknesses so as the author says many people have not really experienced even a moderate degree of synergy in their family or in their other interactions they've been trained and scripted into defensive and protective communications or into believing that other people can't be trusted as a result they're never really open to synergy so for there to be synergy within a team they have has to be trust members of the team have to trust each other to have their back like in the example i started with where people are working together to save lives of those involved in let's say an accident the goal is the same and every effort is aimed towards attainment of this particular goal so same thing happens when soldiers are out in the battlefield they trust each other with their lives they even go as far as saying that leave no man behind as in the entire group would risk their lives by going back to rescue just one soldier one of their own and with such kind of a relationship synergy forms you do your job knowing well that should anything happen to you in the line of duty then your comrades will do everything in their power to save you and you would do the same for them it's one for all and all for one that's synergy right there so for there to be synergy you need courage courage to be open and honest in your communication with others courage to be genuine and authentic in your expressions particularly regarding personal experiences and even self-doubts and the more people can relate to you and with you the safer it makes them feel to express themselves synergy does not mean that there won't be any disagreement within a team it means that even when differences occur instead of people being all defensive they have this genuine need to understand each other the attitude that the author talks about here is one where if a person of your diligence competence and commitment disagrees with me then there must be something to your disagreement that i don't understand and i need to understand it you have a perspective a frame of reference i need to look at it so that is synergy now like we mentioned earlier synergy relies heavily on trust and trust goes hand in hand with communication so there are basically three levels of communication the lowest level being one character 
characterized by defensiveness and protectiveness. You've seen this even in company communication where someone sends an email not because they want to pass a message across but because they want to cover their asses just in case something happens. In this level there is usually very low trust between the team members and the cooperation is low as well. The second level of communication is where people are respectful and interaction is rather mature. There's a lot of give and take, people compromise and try as much as possible to avoid any form of ugly confrontation. And compromise here means 1 plus 1 equals 1.5. Now the communication isn't defensive or manipulative but respectful, honest and genuine. That said, it is not creative and synergistic. The other says that it produces a low form of win-win. Now the highest level of communication is the synergistic kind. This is where 1 plus 1 equals 10 or even more. Trust is high and cooperation as well. There is a genuine desire to collaborate and create something magical. For synergy to exist, the members of the team need to appreciate and respect the differences between each other. We may both be looking at the same picture but we are seeing different things. It's like the photo where two guys are facing each other and between them is a number. One sees 6 while the other sees 9. Now they are both technically correct in the observations but if they are not willing to see things from the other person's perspective then they will never attain synergy in the interaction. So valuing differences mean that we take time to listen. We intentionally seek to understand each other. Yes, I see it differently. Now, let me see what you see. And this sort of reminds me of the Dunning-Kruger effect. As humans, we have blind spots in our knowledge. We sometimes just know enough about a subject to assume that we know everything. Yet, there's still a lot that we don't know. So it's only by listening to others, seeing things from their perspective, that we get to expand our worldview and enhance our understanding of a certain subject. Humility is key here. And synergy within a team provides an atmosphere that allows people to express their views openly without fear of being dismissed. Everyone understands that we have differences in opinions, thoughts, ideas and even vision. But everyone is humble and respectful enough. Everyone values everyone else and this greatly improves communication which in turn creates trust. And with trust, you have more synergy and the virtuous cycle continues. So if you really think about it, everything is related to everything else. In a company, each department is in one way or another connected to the other departments. Each process feeds into several other processes. For you to do your job, you need input from another colleague and your output forms part of someone else's input. Everything is a system of many interconnected processes feeding into each other from work family, your personal life, your friendships, everything is in a way related or connected to everything else. So the constituent processes or part of the system cannot exist independent of each other, just like the company cannot function without the finance department or the sales department. So how well the different parts relate to each other dictates the synergistic culture within that system, within that family, and within that organization. The more genuine the interaction, the more sincere and open it is, then the greater the synergy. And with synergy comes cooperation and trust. So finally, let's take a look at habit number seven which encompasses all the other habits. It's a habit of continuous improvement that ensures you on that upward growth spiral as a person. So habit number seven is sharpen the saw. There's a quote by Abraham Lincoln which says, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four hours sharpening the axe. Now up until I read this book, my idea of sharpening the saw was simply preparation. You have a task, spend as much time as possible getting ready for it so that when you hit the ground running, you'll just be cruising. But after reading this book, I realized that sharpening your so it means a lot more than that. It means reading books to improve your cognition, exercising regularly and eating healthy so as to stay fit, meditating, acquiring new skills such as taking a course on communication skills. As in the book made me realize that you as the person, you are the soul of the axe and life is pretty much the dream. So habit seven is therefore all about keeping yourself sharp so that you can better deal with life. So as you develop and grow yourself both personally and professionally, you are sharpening the soul. As you watch this video, you are in a way already practicing habit number seven. You're intentionally consuming information aimed at making you a better person. You're improving yourself. So there are four dimensions for renewal that the author talks about. These are the physical, social, spiritual, and mental. Now the physical is what we just talked about. Exercise, better nutrition. It's basically taking good care of your body. The social is all about service to others. The spiritual is about your values. What drives you? We talked about a personal mission statement when we were talking about habit number two. That mission statement would really come in handy here. That's because it acts like your North Star. The set of values that guide every decision, every action, every behavior that you take. And a personal mission statement acts as your core and always referencing it makes sure that you do not lose track of your values. Your value system may also be greatly influenced by your belief system. If you're a Christian, then your Christian faith will play a huge role in shaping your values. Regularly reading the scripture and praying will help you clearly define these values, which then informs 
your personal mission statement so moving on to the last of the four dimensions which is the mental dimension this involves sharpening your mental soul by reading and writing regularly for most of us education or should i say learning stopped the day we left school which is sad because education not to be a lifelong endeavor if knowledge is power then learning is your superpower that's a quote right there by jim quick the author of limitless so here's the bitter truth which you may or may not want to hear but someone has to say it anyway if you know how to read but you do not read then you're not different from that person who never went to school and they don't know how to read so make sure you sharpen your soul so that's it for this week's episode of book review i really hope that you've enjoyed it and that you've drawn value from it now if you check the description below i have shared links to some of the tools that i think could be helpful to you for instance in drafting your personal mission statement the personal effectiveness quotient which helps you know how effective you are and these are all tools that the author shares in the book well they're not mine they belong to the author stephen r covey but actually i think now they belong to franklin covey the company that he left because he passed on in 2012 unfortunately but he was gracious enough to leave us with this wonderful and transformative book right here speaking of which i need to give this book to one of you yes i always make sure to give away the books that i review here and there are only two conditions one you have to be subscribed to the channel so if you haven't right now would be a good time to do that two you need to give me the right answer to this question now in the video i have referenced several books by different authors i need you to name at least two books and their respective authors just to type your answers in the comments and i'll be sure to announce the winner of this amazing book in the next episode of book review where i'll also be reviewing yet another amazing book i don't know if i should tell you which book it is that i shall be reviewing um no actually i won't you'll just have to wait and see if i were you i'd hit that notification bell right now so that not to miss that episode trust me it's a really good book anyway thanks for sticking around and if you've enjoyed this video be sure to check out this other one right here it's a review of grant tracy's eat that frog you love it especially if you're someone who's struggling with procrastination you could also check out this one over here where i did a review of atomic habits that one will help you break bad habits as you build healthier ones so until next time don't be good be great <laughs>